Hi, I'm Pastor Matt, the pastor at Christ the King Lutheran Church in Westchester, Ohio. Thank you so much for joining us for our worship webcast today. Please be sure to check out our website at www.ctkluth.org for more information about our mission and ministry and to find ways that you can join us in creatively bringing God's Word to life. Now I invite you to focus your hearts and your minds on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we experience worship together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. A reading from Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in the book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us that we may hear and observe it. No. The word is very near to you, is in your mouth, in your heart, for you to observe. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, you have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Ephrus, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and you may be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time for our gospel interruption. I have with me a survival lamp and radio. It is multifunctional. It has this little crank on the back that if you pull it out and you turn the crank, it actually charges up a rechargeable battery. It provides unlimited power as long as you continue to turn this crank. There are all kinds of functions with this. You can make it a lamp if you want to. It can turn into a red light in case you are in danger or if you want your light to be a little bit lower. It has a flashlight function on it. Even better, you can slide up this little panel here and if you turn on this knob while you crank, you can actually hear the radio play and there's music that goes on. There's even a little button that talks about it being a uh, mosquito repellent. It will make this really high-pitched noise that's really, really annoying, not just to mosquitoes, but to human beings. The amazing thing about this is that all of these features on this are unlimited. As long as I crank this, I've got music, I've got light, I have everything that I need to survive, and it's noisy. But when I stop, it all ends. Today's gospel lesson, we hear a very familiar parable about a Samaritan who looks after someone who has been beaten up. It's a story that Jesus tells to someone who's trying to justify themselves through the law. They want to know how they can inherit eternal life and who they are supposed to love. And Jesus challenges them with a story about mercy. A man is walking along a road and he is set upon by robbers who steal everything that he has and they beat him and leave him for dead. And it just so happens that a priest and a Levite both walk by and go to the other side of the road and ignore this person who is lying there. But a Samaritan comes and has mercy on this person. 
binds up his wounds and takes him to an inn and says to the innkeeper, whatever it takes to maintain this person's health and well-being, I will pay for. It's unlimited mercy that comes from this Samaritan that shows God's love for all of us. And it's just like getting the unlimited power that we have for a survival radio. God's mercy is what powers all of us to receive God's grace and forgiveness in the world. The good news for us is that God never gets tired of turning that crank of mercy for you and for me. We might get tired, we might be selective about who we want to offer mercy and grace to. But God never gives up. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent us your Son, Jesus, to teach us about grace and mercy, to help us know that as reflections of your love through Jesus, we are called to show that same grace and mercy to others, that heaven has already been inherited for us through the gift of your Son. And for that, we say thanks. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have gotten the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who continues to commend us to love our neighbor. Amen. So this probably has to be one of, if not the most famous parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke. I can only think of the prodigal son being something that would be as equally as famous. But one of the things that we miss about this particular parable in this Gospel is Jesus' sense of humor as he tells this. Now, I imagine him during this scene being in a courtyard of the temple and one of the lawyers, the many people who would have studied the Torah and the law of Moses, coming to him and really in earnest having this conversation with Jesus, asking how he can in turn inherit eternal life. And Jesus then in turn says to him, what does scripture say and how do you interpret it? which is a really crucial piece for all of this. It's a question that is asked to you and I all the time. How we interpret Scripture then in turn 
informs how we live our faith out into the world with a Christocentric lens, a lens that is focused on Christ. That helps us to be able to interpret Scripture and find all the places that God calls us to love as we have first been loved. So this is a conversation that is honest, and Jesus is not making fun of or looking down his nose at this particular lawyer who is sent to test Jesus, as, as we are told. But the conversation is a real question about how faith is lived out in the world and about our dependence on law versus experiencing God's grace and mercy in the world. The lawyer knows the law. He knows every jot and tittle of every writing. He has studied it backwards and forwards. And so he is ready to figure out if he has everything understood as far as Scripture is written. So Jesus asks him, what do you read? And the lawyer says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus asks the lawyer to define who neighbor is. Well, the lawyer knows in the law that he is to love those people who are of his tribe and of his kin. That's written very clearly in the law. It's in black and white. But the challenge that the lawyer faces and that we face is that sometimes things might be legal, but they are not moral. And so Jesus is challenging this sense of legality and morality in looking at how neighbors are loved and what is the best interest for the neighbor versus following the law in order that you might be justified and righteous in yourself. So he tells a story. Now you could condense it down. It almost sounds like a joke at first that you have a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan who all just happen to be walking on the same road. There's a bit of humor that is present in here that we miss because we look at this story so seriously. And we act as if Jesus has never had a sense of humor. I mean, after all, this coincidence of events that take place, the man getting beaten up and left for dead, and then not one but two people who are considered pillars of society walking past, and then just a plain Samaritan coming along. There's a sense of humor that is present in here. There's a sense of skewering our understanding of how the world should work. Now, I don't want anybody to think that there is some anti-Semitism that's taking place in all of this. The priest and the Levite, they're stuck in a hard spot because if they think that this person on the side of the road is dead, they're not allowed to go and to touch them. And also we're told they're not heading to Jerusalem, but they're going from Jerusalem towards Jericho. And if they're going to Jericho, it means that they have work that they need to do for the people there, and they don't want to make themselves unclean. So they go past. But there's also something else that's interesting that takes place in this particular story. I don't know if you remember, two weeks ago, Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem and they were heading through a Samaritan town. And the Samaritans did not show Jesus any hospitality at all. James and John are so upset, they want fire to rain down on the Samaritans. So that Jesus would then choose this Samaritan to be kind of the anti-hero of the story is quite telling. Jesus is lifting up somebody who did not show him hospitality and mercy as an example of someone who does show mercy. As he gets to the end of the story, talking about how the Samaritan has taken the wounded man, placed him in an inn, and as in his own expense paid to care for him with basically a blank check, he turns to the lawyer and says, which one of these was neighbor? And the lawyer responds, the one who has shown mercy. We are too often so focused on the law 
We are so focused on wanting to be sure that we are going to punish and make sure that people see where they have fallen short that we forget about mercy. Now, mercy is one of those things that we would like for ourselves, but for everybody else, we want punishment. And in particular, when we get caught doing something bad, we plead for mercy. The good news for you and for I is that mercy has already been given to us in the form of Jesus Christ coming to show us God's grace and forgiveness. That mercy is the engine that drives our faith. Remembering that we have been forgiven in turn calls us to forgive others and show them the same grace and hospitality that our Lord and Savior Jesus shows to us. We are forgetful. We forget that it is mercy which drives everything. And so, yes, like I said before, there can be some things which are legal, but which are not moral or merciful. On the opposite side, there are some things which can be illegal, which actually might be moral, because whoever has created the laws have not thought of mercy or of the love of their neighbor. They've only thought about making sure that people don't step out of line. Too many times Christians point to the Ten Commandments as the end-all, be-all of behavior that we should be living out. They act as if making sure that everybody is on the same page as far as our understanding and our knowledge of God's love for the world is concerned. It all should be through the ten steps in order to receive eternal life. But those are the words of Moses. They're not the words of Jesus, who continues to call us into compassion and mercy and demonstrates that compassion and mercy for the world. Jesus goes to the cross to suffer and die on our behalf. And you can see the engine of mercy charging up the Christian faith. As Christ asks for forgiveness for those who do not know what they are doing. Too many times in this world, you and I don't know what we are doing or fail to understand the way in which we are not operating in mercy or in grace or forgiveness in the way that Christ does. In lifting up the Samaritan, a sworn enemy of the Jewish people, Jesus is turning the idea of what it means to be good and righteous and legal on its head. Jesus comes to turn the world upside down by showing us what is truly valued in God's kingdom isn't power, isn't righteousness, isn't blindly following the law or even following the law to the letter, but it is finding the needs of our neighbors and acknowledging those needs. Do you notice how the Samaritan never asks questions of the man who is in the ditch? He just sees the need and he serves it. And in his mercy and in his compassion, he is able to acknowledge the humanity of a fellow human being who is in need. That's the job of the church, is not to be in judgment, not to do the work of condemnation of others who don't agree with us. Our job is to show the mercy and grace of God through Jesus Christ to continue to do that hard work of living out the gospel in the world. And it is hard. It's so much easier to couch ourselves in self-righteousness, to only love those kith and kin who believe like we do and act like we do. But God's call to love is one that is for all people, to show mercy and grace to those people who are on the margins of our society, for those people who would be overlooked or left in a ditch, that engine of God's mercy continues to turn, and we are called to join in that machine of mercy known as our Christian faith 
in order that others might experience God's grace and forgiveness through us and through us come to know God's love. And it's challenging. I don't think it's ever been more difficult when we have been inundated with messages that we need to hate, that we need to be against, when we live in a culture that wants to cancel people because they say something that is wrong or they have done something decades ago in their youth and inexperience that now has caught up to them. There is no mercy or sense of grace or opportunity for redemption for anyone. Jesus does not come to cancel people. Jesus comes to welcome with open arms, to die on the cross and rise again in order that we might be restored and renewed from all of those things, the mistakes that we have made, our past indiscretions, and unfortunately our future missteps. But that's where God's mercy continues to come in. That we are called to work as hard as we can to be merciful and to love as Christ first loved us. Micah 6 tells us that we are to love justice, do mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. That's what we are seeing in action in this parable. It's what we see in action with Jesus. We are not to stand about and boast proudly of our accomplishments or to boast how righteous we are. We are to humbly follow Jesus' lead, to acknowledge where we fall short and to rely on God's mercy and in turn do the hard work of mercy in our own lives. It's difficult because we always want to make sure that our enemies suffer or that those people will get what they are deserving. But the truth is we are all deserving of punishment. And through God's grace, we are forgiven. And in light of this joyous revelation, we in turn are called to share the good news of forgiveness and welcome and acceptance and restoration with the rest of the world to be agents of God's mercy amongst our neighbors. In small and big things, ways that people can encounter the kingdom of heaven through us, it is crucial for us to continue that work of mercy so that we can be a light and beacon to the world. And for that we say, thanks be to God. And now, May the peace which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh
United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all who are in need. Good and gracious God, you have placed your word of love in the heart of your church. Fill your church with compassion that we bear the fruit of your healing mercy to a broken world. God of grace, hear our prayer. You created the earth with seeds sprouting up to new life. We pray for the flourishing of fruit trees and orchards, vines and bushes. Prosper the work of those who plant, tend, harvest, and gather. God of grace, hear our prayer. Come near to all who are in need. Orchestrate kindness in the face of cruelty. Bring hope where there is despair. Love in the face of neglect. Comfort where there is death. And healing in illness. Be with those we now name out loud or in our hearts. God of grace, Hear our prayer. Turn this community toward our neighbors in need. Bring aid and support to those who are desperate, beaten down, abused, forgotten, silenced, or avoided. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the saints who revealed your love and mercy in this life. Inspired by their witness, strengthen us to live in hope. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Yes, yeah.
God's mercy, like the whiteness of the sea, there's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is no place where the sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. There is welcome for the sinner and a promise grace made good. There is mercy with the Savior. There is healing in His blood. There is grace enough for thousands of the world's as great as this. There is room for fresh creations in that upper home of bliss. Tis not all we owe to Jesus, it is something more than all. Great good because of Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Please be sure to check out our Facebook page and to like us so that you can keep up to date on our most recent mission and ministry activities. And now a challenge for you as you head out into the world, and this is rather difficult for you and for me, but I would like you to think about ways that you can advocate for mercy and to be more merciful in your own life. Find ways that you can express the forgiveness and love of Jesus Christ, especially with those people who have injured you in some way. And now, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and grant you peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord in mercy. Amen. <laughs>